All right, you guys, so here we are, um, April 8th, April 9th, losing track of time here. I don't know if you guys are losing track of days of the week um, and the calendar, but here we are. We're in habit two of the seven habits. So let me, let me give you a little bit of an introduction here. Um, you know, as I was thinking through this whole hiatus thing, and I, something tells me a lot of you guys, you're like, oh, I'm going to have all this time on my hands. I'm going to be at home. You know, what do I want to study? Many of you guys, before I ever announced I'd be doing a little course like this, um, a lot of you started picking up this book. A lot of you have already read the book and you decided to maybe do it again and do a deeper dive. Maybe you didn't get enough the first time. But as I really thought through, like, geez, of all the stuff I've learned, what am I going to teach? Okay, you know, what, what am I going to teach? I've also asked myself, you know, what do I want to learn? And I have my own little list of things I want to uh, add muscle with during this hiatus. But I thought, what value could I add? Um, and there's no doubt in my mind, the course, I'm not even calling it the book, the course that made the biggest impact in my life uh, has been the seven habits of highly effective people. Um, this is a very deep dive. Um, this is, I mean, really, ideally, I've got a couple goals from this for you guys. Okay, and, and maybe you can get aligned. If your goals become my goals, you know, I think we'll have some alignment here. I mean, you're all willing to give hours and hours of your life to do this. That's why I said I tried scaring people and uh, some people weren't scared off by it. I mean, I'm asking for homework assignments. I'm asking you to read the book. And after today, some of you might drop off because I'm going to give you the hardest homework assignment you've ever been asked to do. Um, but I've got two goals. One is, as this book and course has impacted my life, I hope this too impacts your life in the same manner. Obviously, I've read the book. Um, I've taken several courses. I even want to give you an example of how you can get a little, you can really up your game on some of this stuff if you want. I mean, this little deck of cards here that I'm showing, these are called values cards, okay? Now this is related to today's topic of begin with the end in mind. I go to a John Maxwell seminar, we all get a deck of these cards. And there are little things done here like effectiveness, authority, loyalty, teamwork, all these different values. Maxwell does this exercise. He says, okay, pick up your cards. Everybody reach underneath your chair, pick up the cards, and uh, put a pile of cards that apply to you and discard the other pile. Okay, great. That's me. That's not me. That's me. That's not me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's not me. Okay, great. I'm down to about 25 cards. He says, okay, take that the, the small group of cards you have, and narrow it down to your top 10. Oh, gee, this exercise is getting a little tricky. So I got 25 cards here. I'm like, okay, which one? I mean, I got to pick my top 10. Okay. All right. Got it. Got it, John. Thank you. And he's given us several minutes to do this. I got my top 10. He says, okay, I want you to take those 10 cards, narrow it down to five. Oh, and you hear the whole crowd grumbling, about 3,000 of us in the auditorium. Oh, this is hard. This is hard. All right, John, I got my five cards. All right, I want you to take your five. I want you to narrow it down to three. That's interesting. As you go through that exercise, and, and I, I had my three. I mean, I'm even, I'm holding my three. We'll go through this later. I'm like, man, what a powerful exercise that, that was at that seminar. I went on to Amazon. You guys can all do this. I purchased this on Amazon. It's called the Values Cards. You don't have to sign up and spend thousands of dollars on a John Maxwell seminar. You can go on Amazon and for around 12 bucks, you can buy the same thing I just did, the values cards. All that it is, again, same thing. This deck, for whatever reason, has more, but you go through the same exercise. I do this with people I work with. I do this with people I want to get to know better. Go through the cards. What's you, what's not you? Narrow it down to your top 10. 
narrow it down to your top five, narrow it down to your top three. You will know who you're working with if you can narrow it down to three cards. So again, I'm just using this little card thing as an example of this course and this particular chapter, this was a tough one. I've spent a lot of time preparing for this 90 minute little seminar I'm gonna do with you guys here today. This is a, this is a deep chapter. So it's impacted my life. My second goal I have with it, and again, I hope it impacts your life. The second goal I have is ultimately, I want you guys to get so good at this that you guys in turn teach the same stuff that I'm doing. Obviously, I didn't write the material. In fact, some of you guys even last week might have been disappointed. You're like, oh, I have that cheater. He's letting Stephen Covey do all the talking. Well, exactly. I'm letting Stephen Covey do the talking. He wrote the book. We're going to watch the master, the guy who spent, I mean, he, he gets in front of her, you know, he's passed away since, but he would get into big companies teaching this stuff. I've been lucky enough to have his students, employees of his company teach me. So yes, he's teaching it, but I'm teaching it as well too, obviously. Here we are today. It's funny. Uh, um, Last month, right before the coronavirus, literally the week before the coronavirus thing started, I met Ken Blanchard uh, for the first time. Um, Ken is like one of these studs in my mind. I mean, I love Ken Blanchard. I love his material. And I, I didn't even know how to say this. I said, hey, listen, Ken, like, I've been teaching your stuff for years. I almost thought I was maybe getting in trouble with him a little bit. Like, all the stuff that I've learned from you, I am teaching uh, all the time. And it's not like I'm paying a royalty to his company for all the material that I'm using. So I said, it. that's why I was a little squeamish about it. I'm like, you know, is, is that okay that I teach your stuff? I mean, I teach situational leadership all the time. I teach DISC all the time and well done. Those are all, those three are Ken Blanchard's. And he's nodding as I'm saying how I teach your stuff. He's nodding as I'm explaining the stories of how I use his material in my everyday language. And he says, that's how you know that you've learned it well. So yes, I want you teaching my stuff is what Ken Blanchard said. I'm like, good, that's what I was hoping you were gonna say. But if you can't teach these seven habits by the time we're all done, in your 40 hours of work you're gonna do it in the month of April, we didn't do it right. So that is an ask I have, that's a goal that I have, for everybody watching this is that a it makes a big impact on your life these habits become cemented and two you pay it forward you teach this stuff okay those are my goals for you and so here we go all right so last week's homework assignment last week's homework assignment was to read habit one we went through the habit of being proactive, okay? And number two, you had to have read Begin With the End in Mind Habit 2. That was my ask for this, for the homework. Now listen, if you haven't done the homework, I would say, if you're watching the recorded video, you, you stop, and you do the homework before you proceed. If you're actually live on the Zoom and you haven't done the homework, and I'm not doing roll call here, I prefer if you excuse yourself and then you can always watch the recording. Listen, one of the, we're, today we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about values. I mean, do you value integrity? You don't have to answer that question right now. But if you value integrity, you might want to, oh, you know, I didn't do it. You know, I have every intention to. Great. Do homework assignment number one, which was read habit one, read habit two. And then we're going to do this course. At the end of today, you're going to have a very lengthy homework assignment. It's going to be a tough one. And I'm gonna ask you to do that before we go to habit three. 
So you got to follow the progression of things. We're not just reading a book and then putting it down. You guys are investing a lot of time into this. Again, I've taken, I've taken courses, classes all day, sitting in a classroom for eight hours, getting instructed on this stuff, and then doing a homework assignment to follow up. So if you really want to get the max out of this, which you signed up for, you got to follow through and I hope you have the value of integrity. Okay. So when I think of begin the end of my, we're going to start a video here shortly. It's 30 minutes of Stephen Covey today. 32 if you want exact numbers. Um, I always, when I think of begin with the end in mind, I always think of, and this is right in the book. It's either in the book or the course. I can't remember, but um, Alice in Wonderland. Should sound familiar a little bit. Alice in Wonderland. Alice comes across the Cheshire cat. There's a fork in the road. And uh, Alice sees the cat and says, excuse me, um, which path should I take? And the cat says, well, that depends. Where do you want to go? And she says, well, I'm not sure. And he says, well, I guess it doesn't matter which path you take then, does it? I mean, that's just, again, I always think of that little story when I think of this wildly important habit here. If you don't know where you're going, you won't have clarity in decision making when you reach the forks in the road. I mean, think about it for career options as well, too. I mean, if you don't know where you want to end up, well, then I guess it just doesn't matter what career choices you take then, does it? If you don't really care, if you don't know. Now, if you know where you want to end up, it's a lot easier to say no to a whole lot of different options coming in front of your desk, isn't it? Like, you've got to know the end in mind. I mean, you'll hear, you know, Stephen Covey talking about this stuff, but I'll just say this little, I think he'll say this in the video. Habit one is awareness that you are the programmer. You have the power to choose. That's what we got out of habit one. You are the programmer. You're not a victim. The program hasn't been pre-written and you just got to follow it. You're the programmer. You've got the power to choose. Habit two says, now write the program. Decide what your life is about. Your identity, your purpose. You are the programmer. Write the program. Okay, so... I'll pause it uh, as we go through the 32 minutes, and then I've got a whole bunch of stuff to go through with you guys, and I'm going to get pretty raw. I'm going to share with you some of my values that I've been working on and encourage you guys to do something very similar, not necessarily adopt my values, but go through the same process that I went through. So without further ado, let's bring Mr. Covey onto the screen here. And I think I figured out how to make it sound better for you guys, too. Let's see if I can do this. All right. Where do we get our sense of who we are? Where do we get our sense of what our life is about. Is it not from social mirrors, parents, siblings, teachers, leaders, the media, heroes, models? Isn't that possibly the case of a mistaken identity? Think about it. Ask yourself, where do I get my knowledge of myself? And what my vision in life is? What is it that I am really about? What is truly important to me? In habit two, begin with the end in mind is a clear and powerful declaration that you are the guardian, the protector of your identity, of your future. 
In essence, habit one is the awareness that you are the programmer. It's the budding awareness that the best way to predict your future is to create it. Habit two decides what your life is about. And everything would flow from that. Every decision, large and small, would be a function of that. Not only what your identity is, but what your purpose is. What is your vision of what your life is about? You are the programmer, then write the program. Now another interesting thing about life is that it is always created twice. Always. Whether you take conscious control of the creation or not, you'll get your definition of yourself and of your purpose, your meaning, from the social mirror. So it was already done. Or perhaps you'll get it from the social agenda of people that are pressing upon you now. Or perhaps you'll get it from the mentoring of your childhood. Or the mentoring of your first leaders in business, your first managers, or your teachers in school. The first creation is an intellectual creation. The first creation is of the mind and of the spirit. The second creation is a physical creation. This building that we're in now was created in every detail before the earth was touched. If that was not the case, the price of the building doubled because of expensive change orders. Anyone want to share your experiences with expensive change orders? Why they came about? Okay. I'm in the restaurant business and we build a lot of restaurants. Uh, we built a restaurant a year ago that had severe access problems. We didn't plan in advance. We let external forces drive our decisions, zoning, the city, etc. And we've got a situation there where we've got a $600,000 restaurant. Nobody can come in or leave. <laughs> now, in a sense, <clears throat> the, the food is good. <laughs> Great food, but people just can't get access to it. But really, you can get your mind so focused upon, say, the pressures that you're under, political, civic, community, and get so kind of embroiled in that battle that it starts to dominate your consciousness. And then that begins to shape your whole approach. Now we've gone in and uh, we've worked with people and we've taken the time and the planning necessary to make a change. And it's going to cost, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars to make that change. But in order to make the return on the restaurant, we've Better got do to do it. I think you can see the applicability of the idea to any field of endeavor, really. I have a friend who's an orthodontist. I have paid his mortgage for the last 25 years. <laughs> because all our kids have my teeth and my wife's mouth. <laughs> Dick, how do you do this? He said, first, I get a clear image of what that mouth should look like when I finish. Every decision is governed by it. I just want to repeat that. I get a clear image of what that mouth should look like when I finish. Now that's a dentist. Okay, so substitute the word mouth for whatever it is that industry that you're in. I get a clear idea of what it should look like when I finish. Every decision is governed by it. I mean, that, that's worth kind of slowing down, pausing, writing down. Got a clear decision of what it looks like when, I'm, when I finish. Every decision is governed by it. Just like the construction person comes right onto the site, the first thing goes to the blueprint. And the blueprint is all based on the artistic rendering, what the place should look like, see? How many here have ever done jigsaw puzzles? How useful is it to have the end in mind? 
<laughs> Another good image. Imagine putting a jigsaw puzzle together if you didn't know what the picture looked like. You know, just a good image of this habit. I find that the key is to begin with the end in mind. This is so basic with organizations. The fundamental reason, the root reason, why organizations are so split is they do not share a common vision. Do you want to have an interesting experience? Just go to your family tonight and ask them. Be sincere. They'll think you flipped out for a moment, wondering where you're coming from, but say to them, in one sentence, what is the purpose of our family? And then write down what they say. Just read the different purposes. What is the purpose of our marriage? What is its essential reason for being? And then when you go to your organization, to your work, ask the first 10 people you meet, ring out your trusty clipboard, and just say, I'm doing a little survey. Could you help me? One question. What is the purpose of our organization? And then you work with a small work group. What is the purpose of this work group? What is the purpose of the board of directors? What is the purpose of this executive committee? What is its essential role? What are its high priority goals? My friends, I have done this scores of times, even with the executive cabinets of companies in the Fortune 100 classification. Big companies, sophisticated organizations. And in almost all cases, the top executives are absolutely chagrined, embarrassed. They cannot believe the different descriptions that are being given as to purpose, as to vision. You think, what's going on? I mean, really? And you could have a mission statement on the wall or on little plaques on their desks or in their wallet or purse or whatever. It is not central to the culture. The whole organization cannot begin with the end in mind. What if everybody participated in the use of their proactive capacity to create that vision and to participate in it and to create it over a period of time to where they really feel it? That is our vision. We share it together. To begin with the end in mind is the most important decision. And you know this applies to every field of human endeavor. If you don't take charge of the first creation, it will be done for you, even for you personally. And you could live your whole life based upon a very limited, straight-jacketed notion of who you are, based on a few social mirrors, and have never unleashed the talent, the unique gifts that you may have been given. Now, I think we have come to recognize the power of the space and that the most significant use of it should always be, what is it I am about? And what are the principles I want to operate my life on? Would you not agree? Because every other decision will be influenced by those decisions. I want to use a metaphor. If I can borrow your glasses, please. <laughs> can you see without them? A little bit. Barely. <laughs> I suggest that whatever you decide should be put at the center of your life. The reason why it is the most significant decision is that it affects all decisions. 
it would be analogous to a lens through which a person would see life. Everything that I look at through this lens is affected by it. Eventually, you become unaware of the lens. Fish discover water last. Most paradigms are like that. They are assumptions you never question. That is just the way things are. So the lens I look through governs how I see everything. All right, now let's just say that I put my work at the center of my life. Now for those of you guys that have studied Tony Robbins or been to his seminars, a lot of overlap going on here. I mean, this is deep stuff. I mean, the way you interact and the way you see things, you, you have this lens and Tony would encourage people to potentially trash a lens and put a different one on. I mean, he's got workshops around that, but really powerful stuff here. And maybe my question is, or question to ask yourself, am I even aware of my lens? Everything is oriented around my work. All relationships, all pleasures, everything has to do with my work. Tell me, let's say I'm in the sales business, my work is the center. How do I see my relatives? Customers. <laughs> Contacts, customers, referral sources. How would you perceive your little children, let's say? with this pair of glasses on. You're work-centered. Obstacles. Yeah, obstacles. Oh, I have to deal with that. <sighs> what an interference. Go through the motions, you know. Try to do my family thing so that I can get back to work. Now look, if I were family-centered, how would I see work? As an interference, as an obstacle. Yeah, or positively, as a, means to, as a means to take care of the family. Interesting, that one right there. Over the years, I've met people that I've worked with that have left, that said, oh, listen, you know, my family is, is really important to me. That's why I can't work here. It's just too demanding. And I've always scratched my head saying, well, family is really important to me. That's why I work here so I can take care of my family. Again, interesting, right? Interesting stuff, but I mean, what is the center and then how do you, how do you work with that? It's interesting. I'm family centered. That's another pair of glasses, but you never question your center. It's a paradigm of life. It is a pair of glasses. If your spouse centered, if your family centered, if you're work-centered, if you're enemy-centered, if you're possession-centered, what happens? We could go through this analysis and analyze every alternative center or even a combination of them. And literally, I'll guarantee, at the conclusion of it all, it will cause tremendous imbalance. Your life will be unfulfilled. We must come up with a center that enables us to have more of the good in every other center. What could that be? What center would enable you to lay hold on every good thing in every other center? Think for a moment. It would have to deal with whatever change came along because it would be changeless. It would have to deal with something that would give you a constant frame of reference to make all decisions by. It would have to give you the unleashing of your power, high levels of capacity, of mental and emotional and, and social power, where you become a force, the creative force of your own life, where you become someone who influences for good other people's lives, who models and mentors others toward a center that they themselves select. What would this center be? It's principles. Why do you say principles? Because they don't change. Okay, they don't change. They're changeless. In fact, even as we discuss this right now, my friends, 
you are listening through your center. Saying principle-centered doesn't make it so. You are listening to principles through your center. The key is not just a principle. It's a balanced set of principles that deals with the totality of our nature. Deep stuff. I suggest the essence, the highest essence of habit two to be. Um, side note, this will be one of the homework assignments this week. Personal mission statement. Begin with the end in mind. Is the development of a personal mission statement. A personal philosophy a personal constitution, a personal purpose statement, whatever you want to call it, I seriously think that is the most important activity of habit two. I think it should contain two basic parts. What is it I am about? And how do I go about it? What are the principles upon which I operate? It should deal in both of those parts with the essence of who am I? And you have the capacity through your mind to separate the social mirror from that question. I know what other people say about me. I know what they say I should be. But I have to decide. We lead three lives. Our public life. Here we are here. This is our public life, our private life. When we go home, we can watch television, we can read. That's a private life. But when you're dealing with the development of a personal constitution, you have to go into the deep inner life, the life that influences the other two, the life where you decide the most fundamental issues of your life. Search your own hearts for out of it flow the issues of your life. It's a more secret life. No one knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. You alone have that awareness. And you can step in on your own deep internal life. You can step in on it. You can take charge of it. My friends, think about it. Study the lives of people that rose above difficulty, abuse, contention, dysfunctional homes. Study the lives of great figures in history who have really made a difference. And you'll almost always find they did profound work on the inner life. The private life is not the inner life. I could live a very private, independent life and enjoy it. It could be relaxing to me. It could be pleasurable. It could be my own life, my own choices. That is not the deep inner life at all. The deep inner life requires going inside and looking at your private and your public life, at both of them. It goes inside to look at your own motive structure. Many people, unless they are in pain because of something they care about that is not being fulfilled, will never even go into their deep inner life. In a sense, they're being lived. They're not living. And Gandhi, at one time he said, a person cannot do right in one department of life whilst attempting to do wrong in another department. Life is one indivisible whole. Listen to his statement. A person cannot do right in one department of life. For instance, the public life, to have the right appearance, see. Whilst attempting to do wrong 
in the private life or say the deep inner life why life is one indivisible whole and people feel it the vibes are sent out so my friends I suggest work on two things vision and principles and this will be profound deep work get perspective take time be patient give yourself several months I'm giving you one week some of you are laughing yes it's a lifelong journey but we got to start with something so but he said this is not a short assignment by any means at least weeks you've got to pay a price why because there's so much scarring there's so much history social and psychic history already in you you probably will discover pockets in your life that you don't want to look at closets motives that really are not of the highest order from your own standard there are defense mechanisms that are used in other words prepare to pay the price get into nature is extremely helpful to get alone in nature to begin to look deeply at yourself in fact one of the stories I really like was this person who was filled with some kind of disease he couldn't identify went to see his friend who was also a physician can you help me I don't know what it is. I just don't feel good. It's just a kind of a general malaise and a, I don't have much energy. Can you help me? The friend knew this person well. He talked for a period of time and then he said, yes, I think I can help you. I have four prescriptions, but you must follow them implicitly. Where is your favorite place? Well, what do you mean? When you were a boy, what did you look forward to the most? Where did you like to be? He said, oh, the beach. I mean, all year long, we would think about the beach. And every chance we had, we would go to the beach. We would have family times. I did so much. He said, fine. He writes out the prescriptions. Go to the beach and spend the day following these prescriptions. What do you do? Medicine? follow the prescriptions you're kidding wait till you see my bill no, no, no. <laughs> but you can't take anything no radio no reading material no books no magazines just get deep into nature first prescription you take at nine the next one at twelve the next one at three and the next one at six he arrives at the beach walks down from his car pulls out the prescription listen carefully two words listen carefully what could this possibly mean see he's in his private life isn't he I mean, I've listened to everything I can hear right now. I'm finished. And I have to do this for three hours. <laughs> okay, I heard those birds, yeah. Good. I hear the surf coming in. And even hear sand crabs if I listen very carefully. I, I can hear them. I can hear the, the wind blowing. I can hear the rustle. Isn't that interesting? The more I listen, the more I can hear. He's starting to silence himself, to get quiet, to slow down this frantic pace of his public life and his disenchanted private life. 
he almost, after a period of time, becomes euphoric. He's so peaceful. He just hasn't felt this way. He's getting deeper into his inner life. He's almost loath to take the second prescription because he has really enjoyed this first one. He pulls out the second one. Three words this time. Try reaching back. That throws him. What could this possibly mean? Try reaching back. Well, maybe I should start thinking about the past. So he started to get into his memory. You know, I remember after school, I, I can remember the excitement we had. I can remember my brother. What a choice association. He became very nostalgic, very emotional. He remembered running down the beach after school with his brother, just screaming like wild people that just couldn't get enough of this fresh air, this, this scene, this freedom, and the excitement, and how they would just kind of dance around and, and hug each other, and they would have family times, and they would play in the surf and the water and build castles, and this thing went on for three more hours. And he was even more loath to move to the third prescription. This time, though, he was really deep into his inner life, which contains so much of memory. Third prescription. This was the tough prescription. This was the core prescription. The other two were in preparation for this one. This drove him into his deep inner life with enormous force. Re-examine your motives. For three hours, re-examine his motives. What is my center? What is my vision? What is my mission? What is my core? What is it I'm about? This was tough, really tough. He began to observe a pattern. He began to discover that he had put at the center of his life himself his own need fulfillment, that he was selfish. Even some of his so-called selfless activities were selfish in that he wanted to be known for them. There was nothing anonymous, deeply anonymous, in his service to others. His private life was different than his public. He would put on that he was caring, but inwardly there was some selfish motive that was being served inside himself. And he started to come to an awareness, his malaise, his boredom, his disease was of the spirit, the selfishness of his life that his whole motive structure was improperly centered, not on true contribution. And he spent much of that time reorganizing, reorienting, replanting new motives, new desires, those that were congruent with higher principles. And that was the creative part. He started using his imagination instead of just living out of his memory. You see, when you live out of your memory, you focus upon the past. When you live out of your imagination, you focus on the future. What lies behind us is nothing compared to what lies within us and ahead of us. But it took this self-analysis, this self-awareness, this self-exploration to get him to the point where he was really willing to explore, to examine his motives, and to cultivate new ones. When six o'clock came, he had finished. For the first time, 
he knew, I know what my life is about. I know what I'm not about to. I know the cause of my problem. I haven't yet healed it, but I know what the direction is I want to take. So he takes out the last prescription, and it says, now write your troubles in the sand. He takes a piece of shell and goes to the high water mark and makes a few markings on the sand. And the last sentence is, and the tide was coming in. It's a beautiful story. It contains a lot of real wisdom in it. It teaches you, don't start writing your mission statement yet. Prepare to write it. Now, maybe you've been preparing for a long period of time. Maybe you've done some of this deep inner work and you're prepared for it. Everyone is at a different place. Try to tap into your sense of vision. What are your unique gifts? Use self-knowledge. Take time. Listen to those who see the potential in you. Listen to them. Sense their affirmation of you. Study the lives of people who have inspired you, of heroes. What is it you so admired? So you can get a sense of what principles you want to build upon. You want to write a mission statement that is timeless. You want to write something that will never change. Now, in fact, as you mature and your consciousness raises and so forth, you will change it. But you write it as if it will never change. That's the source of integrity. And integrity is the source of power. In your integrity around a balanced set of principles that you yourself have settled on. Wow. A little heavy? Do I still have the audience? That's heavy stuff. All right, on the, uh, yeah, that's heavy stuff, man. So I'm gonna read from my little book report. Remember I said, you know, good, a good thing to do, I don't do this with every book that I read, but if I really wanna cement a book in my brain, I'm gonna write a book report. Um, so I wanna read the notes from habit two that I have in my book report. It's only a handful of bullets, but let's see if you pulled the same stuff out of it when you read Habit 2. But here goes. I'm just going to read a little bit and try to marinate on what I'm saying here. So to begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now and so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. And here was a powerful next one that, that struck home to me. It's incredibly easy to get caught up in an activity trap, in the busyness of life, to work harder and harder at climbing the ladder of success, only to discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. It is possible to be busy, very busy, without being very effective. People often find themselves achieving victories that are empty, successes that have come at the expense of things they suddenly realize were far more valuable to them. People from every walk of life, doctors, actors, politicians, business professionals, athletes, plumbers, often struggle to achieve a higher income, more recognition or a certain degree of professional competence, only to find that their drive to achieve their goal blinded them to the things that really mattered most and now are gone. It's a heavy statement. How different our lives are when we really know what is deeply important to us and keeping that picture in mind, we manage ourselves each day to be and to do what really matters most. If the ladder is not leaning, leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. Love that line. Uh, we may be very busy, we may be very efficient, 
but we but will also be truly effective when we begin with the end in mind. Um, personal mission statement. Once you have a sense of your mission, you have the essence of your own proactivity. You have the mission and the values which direct your life. You have the basic direction from which you set your long and short term goals. And we're going to get into this sucker next week, big time. You have the power of a written constitution based on correct principles against which every decision concerning the most effective use of your time, your talents and energies can be effectively measured. And then my last statement that I drew from this book, too many vacations that last too long, too many movies, too much TV, too much video game playing, too much undisciplined leisure time in which a person continually takes the course of least resistance gradually wastes a life. Ouch, <laughs> ouch. It ensures that a person's capacity stay dormant, that talents remain undeveloped, that the mind and spirit become lethargic and that the heart is unfulfilled. Where is the security, the guidance, the wisdom, and the power? Again, powerful, powerful book, man. So, so just to go down a little personal stuff here with you guys. So uh, just a quick story. So I met Gary Polson in the year 2000. Makes me sound ancient to many of you that I work with. The year 2000 is when I had the privilege of meeting Gary. This is before Gary started working with us. So he came to visit my office as an outsider, checking out the business. And I was a rookie owner at the time. He asked me a question, and I'm sure he asked everybody this question. Gary was always an inquisitive, curious guy. He says, Jamie, what's your biggest challenge? It's a loaded question. You know, Gary, what's, or Jamie, what's your biggest challenge? I said, Gary, it feels like, and again, I remember saying this, and I remember him just listening. I said, it feels like my life, the speedometer says 100 miles an hour. I mean, I'm, I, I go full speed, man. I work hard. I put in a lot. But it feels like I'm only going 10 miles an hour. I said, it feels like my tires are spinning on ice. He didn't say anything. He didn't give me any advice. He just... He heard that. Months later, Gary says to me, he says, he says, Jamie, I want to send you and Vera to a time management seminar. Okay. The time management seminar happened to be on a Monday. I remember, I can't remember exactly the, the day. Uh, it was sometime in December. It was on a Monday. And I'm typing an email to Gary that says, Gary, I'm sorry, I don't have time for a time management backspace, 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 backspace. Thank you, looking forward to it. <laughs> it's almost like I thank you for discovering the problem. I, I didn't have time for a time management seminar. That was interesting. At this quote unquote time management seminar, which wasn't a time, it was a Franklin Covey focus class, is what it was called. Covey, you recognize the name Covey, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. Focus was the name of the class. The massive homework assignment that was given to us at the end of that class, and I remember I was sitting there with Vera, it was just me and Vera and a whole bunch of people not from our business. They said, you have 48 hours to complete this task. Almost sounds like a Mission Impossible thing or something like that. You have to identify your values, write your values down with a clarifying statement beside each value. I go on to say that most people, and, we, and Vera and I were spent. We had put in a good 10-hour day easily. This was at a hotel at, at, at LAX. Um, again, maybe 40, 50 people attended this class. And they said, a lot of people go to this class, they, they just don't do it. You got 48 hours to do it. 
I'm telling you, you have 48 hours from right now. I have 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Wednesday. You have till 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Friday. Last I checked, you're quarantining anyway. I mean, I, I got you right where I want you. You know, you, you don't have that many distractions. And that was the beginning of an extremely powerful time in my life, a, a really powerful exercise. I want to give you something else along those lines. I went to another uh, Stephen Covey course. Many of my colleagues were at this course with me. This was probably 14 years ago. This fellow by the name of Hoke, H-O-A-C, Hoke, not a common name. He was, uh, he was employed by Stephen Covey's company, okay, Franklin Covey. He was a Green Beret guy, like this chiseled military, like powerful guy instructing the class. And he said at the beginning of this class, uh, something along the lines, and nobody dared interrupt this guy. He spoke and you just listened was kind of how it worked. And I'll never forget this line. He says, you don't choose your values. Your values are exposed through your daily decisions. And I wrote that down. And some of you may want to write that down. Pretend I'm Hulk for a second. And I'm like, listen, you don't choose your values. Your values are exposed through your daily decisions. I'm like, what? I mean, I'm, I'm writing this down. And I'm like, I don't like what he said. I really don't like what he said. I don't, I don't choose. Well, if I don't choose him, who chose him? And I, so I really didn't like it. And again, I didn't interrupt him, nor did anybody else. I came up to him at the first break. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Hoke, it's Nice to meet you, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, I wrote down what you said and I really don't like it. And he was like, he's like, great, exactly. I'm glad somebody brought this up. And right after the break, he brought it up and said, Jamie, do you, do you mind explaining to me where your anxiety came from about that? And really the whole next few hours in the course, is he's like, you have to reverse engineer life here. You've got to stop. You've got to pause. You've got to choose. Again, if you don't like what I said, you don't choose your values. Your values are exposed to your daily decisions. Well, then you've got to stop. Write your constitution of who your, what your values are proactively. There's the habit of being proactive. And then those values should be exposed going forward in your daily decisions. Tough. So something, again, here's where I get a little personal with you guys. It's two o'clock. I got about 30 minutes left. I'm not expecting you to read this. I'm not expecting you to zoom in. You can just see it's a piece of glass. It's got a nice little frame and it's got the HEP values. HEP, that's me. It's got my mission statement at the bottom as well too. It's in glass. It's like, like a piece of like, um, it's, I mean, how did Covey put it as he was explaining to it? Like, it's just, it's almost like this is on a stone tablet, chiseled on a stone tablet. However, Every time I make an adjustment on this, I reprint it and put it in the glass for the new constitution. And it's constantly changing. Been doing this for at least 15 years and it changes multiple times per year. So I wanna share a couple of these and share some of the interesting thing that happens. Again, remember the homework assignment, you can write this. So far, you've got two homework assignments. I don't know if you paid close attention. Homework assignment one is you've got to make your first rough draft of a mission statement, a personal mission statement. He says it's going to take you weeks. It's going to take you years. 
especially I'm looking at a young audience. You're in your 20s. A lot of you guys are in your 20s. You don't think it's going to change when you're in your 30s, your 40s, 50s? You're going to write a personal mission statement. And actually before the mission statement, you are going to write down your values. Well, what's the right number of values? We'll get to that in a bit. You're going to write down your values and a clarifying statement beside your values. So let me share, let me share a couple of these. And I figured really the only way I could really teach this is to really be vulnerable with you guys and really transparent. And so, you know, what's interesting is I rattle through this stuff. Anybody that knows me, right, if you really know who I am, you could say, yeah, that's, I mean, that's totally Jamie. Or you could say to yourself, man, he is so full of crap. And again, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So I, I want to tell you even something embarrassing. Again, one of the things that happens as you go through this process. So one of my values is health. I value health. I put on here spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional be extremely healthy in all four areas. That was my clarifying statement. Now, looks good on paper, looks good in glass. You show up at Jamie's house and you, and the, you get personal with me. Yeah, looks great. However, at the time I wrote this, I was smoking cigarettes. Now, Let's think about this for a second. And every month, I, I do this exercise every month. The first Sunday of every month, I have a one-on-one -on -one with me. Okay, little known fact about me. I have a one-on-one -on -one the first Sunday of every month, 12 times per year. I have a one-on-one -on -one with me. Very quiet time. And I go through these values one at a time, slow. On a weekly basis, actually, this is not really related, but... Um, we call it HEP huddle. Every Sunday, my family and I, we go through, we look at behaviors the kids do, and we draw attention to some of the values. We see them um, actively, you know, pursuing, and we just draw attention to it. So we do that weekly, but every month, I'm solo with my, with my values. So I have to take a look as I'm reading through that and say, Jamie, you're so full of crap. I mean, you say on here that it's a value of yours to be healthy. You even clarified it saying, I want to be spiritually healthy, physically healthy, mentally, emotionally. Now, you're saying physical health and you're smoking cigarettes. So one of two things needs to happen. Either you need to stop lying and just adjust. It's no big deal. It's just a backspace. I just need to remove the word physical from my values. No big deal. I can still be spiritually healthy, emotionally healthy, and mentally healthy. I either have to remove the word physical because I am not, again, your values are exposed in your daily decisions. Back to good old Hulk here. Or you have to quit smoking. It's one or the other. There's no, like, third option. So take a guess. What happened? I stopped smoking. So it's interesting with these values is you get to call yourself out on these. Again, monthly one-on-ones. I'll share some more. Uh, marriage. Marriage is a value. Joanne, that's my wife, is a gift from God. Love and cherish her as the most important person in my life. I like that value, and so does she. Uh, attitude. My kids have this written on their chalkboard. Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. I will live my life with a positive attitude. Priority management. 
Invest time wisely in the things that matter most. And back to the coronavirus stuff, what could I teach? Well, there you go. You're getting some exposure to me. Invest time wisely in the things that matter most. Purpose. It's easy to figure out the what's and the how's once I have clearly identified why. Hard work. Again, I'm just giving you guys some examples. You'll have your own, but again, value, clarifying statement. You can't just write down the value. You got to back it up. Hard work. I put a Bible verse in for this one. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So no matter what I'm going to do as far as working, I'm working hard for God, not for anything else. And then I'll always work hard. It's kind of how we look at it. Money. Well, this one's interesting. Money. Financial independence is more important than displaying high social status. It's interesting. Be a river with money, not a reservoir. Okay. Clarifying statements, important. Personal growth. Personal growth is never accidental, it's intentional. Be a great student of great leaders, be curious. My son, let me share this. My son is going through this exercise. I think this is interesting. I mean, Dane's values, he's 10. My son is 10. So interesting, right? So love, God, family, others, creativity. Kid just loves Lego. Lego's on here twice. You know, fun is a value. What's interesting, he didn't write this down. I wrote this down for him. He saw one of those commercials on TV, those, the SPCA commercial. And he wanted to donate $19 a month to be part of this thing. And uh, then when it came to this little value stuff, I'm like, Dane, do you realize that you have the value of compassion? I'm like, you, you're donating money to a cause. You, you have big compassion for people, for animals. I mean, obviously I'm throwing a little plug at my boy. I'm proud of my little family here, but his values were exposed through his daily decisions interesting right helping him become a man thinking about this kind of stuff i think that's just wildly important personal mission statement might as well share this with you guys and some being all raw and vulnerable and stuff like that and again it's changed over the years make it simple make it easy and again you can either say you know what that totally sounds like hell that's him or you can say man he's so full of crap and both parties are probably right. And if I'm ever full of crap, man, you can always call me out on it and I will accept it. To live a life of integrity, servant leadership, and faith. Add value to others with care, empowerment, and example setting. That's it. That's it. There's the cause of my life. You know, so I'm going to go back to Ken Blanchard, and then I'll, I'll open it up to some questions and stuff like that. It was interesting. I mean, in this conversation with Ken Blanchard, which was a total fluke, it's not like him and I are buddies or anything like that. I was just, I tagged along and, and got to know this guy. You know, his personal, you know, we had such a deep conversation. His idea of a personal mission statement, he actually wrote his own obituary and videotaped it and will be presented at his funeral with his family. I asked him if it's going to become public. He says, well, I haven't made that decision yet. I'm like, well, nerds like me who've been studying you for years, 
I'd like to see your obituary. That's how he made his personal mission statement, an obituary. He, he did it last. He did it was 10 years ago. He's redoing it now. He's 85 years old. He's going to redo it now. I asked him what his values are. I don't know if anybody's asked him that in a setting like that. Um, I mean, again, I feel like I know the guy. I've read so many of his books and I've been to his classes and stuff like that. And without batting an eye, without, without uh, you know, being reserved, he's like, yeah, I've got four. Spiritual peace, integrity, can people count on your word? Love, how do I show people I really care? And joy, I want to be joyful. I asked him, I said, well, you know, Ken, I'm, um, I'm like, I have 31 values. I've got 31 on here. I said, is, are you saying, you know, you've only got four. He says, here's what he said to me. He says, I don't believe that you can have more than three or four core values. He said, God gave the Israelites 10 commandments and Jesus had to come and simplify it to two. He was all about keeping it nice and simple. Well, that's interesting. My core values, this is interesting. If I had to sum it all up into core values, I've got the acronym LIFE. Most people don't know my real company name is called Life Consulting. It just happens to be doing business as TAG. But it's LIFE, L-I-F-E. Leadership, integrity, faith, and excellence. There's my core. That's the core of who I am. Sometimes that excellence thing can drive people a little nuts. Right? Make today my masterpiece. Integrity. Do the right thing when no one's looking. Leadership. Serve others. And faith. Put God at the center of my life. So your homework assignment, and then I'll, I'll open this up a little bit again. It's a heavy one. This is a heavy one here, man. This is the core of who you are. And this is not easy. I want you to right within 48 hours this one's not a weekly you have 48 hours 2 p.m pacific standard time friday if you're a person of integrity you'll do it or you'll drop out of the class you can drop out that's an option but don't keep moving forward and not do this your values and a clarifying statement there's no right or wrong ben franklin had 13. Ken Blanchard's got four. I've got 31. There is no right number. You take a rough draft and a mission statement after you've done the values. Something you can memorize. If I were to ask you your mission statement and you can't rattle it off, it's not a mission statement. Mission statement of my company for years. This is kind of fun. I'll share this with you. Grow, period. Grow right, period. Grow right now, period. That was my company mission statement forever. Grow. You come to work, you're growing. You're not into growth. You don't like all this Tony Robbins stuff I'm shoving at you or Ken Blanchard or any of this stuff. You're in the wrong company. I don't know what to tell you. You're going to grow here. You're gonna grow right. You're gonna grow the right, the ladder's gonna lean against the right wall here. And you're gonna grow right now. There's some urgency now. Don't blow it off to tomorrow. That was my company mission statement forever. Personal mission statement, you guys should have it cemented here. So make it simple. Uh, so those two things and then third homework assignment. And again, it's asking you a lot in a short period of time is you gotta read habit three. Put first things first. The wisdom next week, once we get into this stuff, I'm gonna start it all off with this little pyramid that I got at a um, Stephen Covey course. The real essence to getting things done is you identify your values is at the base of the pyramid. All, your, all decisions you make come out of your core values whether you like it or not. Again, your values are exposed through your decisions. So let's re-engineer this, identify our core values. Then we're gonna set some goals. 
Heck, you could set some 10-year goals, one-year goals. You're going to set some goals. You're going to plan weekly. And then at the top of the pyramid is daily planning. Simple. There's four layers to this thing. So habit one bleeds into habit two. Habit two bleeds into habit three. And that's going to be next week, same time. I'm going slow through habits one, two, and three. And then I'm going to rip through four, five, six, and seven in a pretty short period of time and much less homework, much less. Are you guys clear on the homework assignment? We're going to, again, get on Zoom next Wednesday. I'll try to get it up to 1,000. I apologize. I don't know what happened there. But again, watch the recording if, you know, send it to people if they're asking. They, they couldn't get on. Um, and then next week's where the rubber meets the road. And again, I think I look at it this way. If you're really good at having one, two, and three during the rest of the coronavirus time, you, if you got those three habits straight, it's going to be scary what you can accomplish while you're quarantined. Scary. You're going to reinvent yourself. You're going to come out of this thing like a, you know, a caterpillar, you know, turns into a butterfly. I mean, you're going to come out of your cocoon and you're going to do some crazy things. I mean, that's really the goal here. I see some people doing this. It's very cute. All right, enough analogies for me. So I've kind of, I've gone through a lot of heavy stuff. Let me just look at my notes, make sure I'm not missing anything. I got it all. Okay, any questions you guys have? This is your time. Hey, Jamie. Kevin. Yeah, hey there. Um, I was wondering, do you keep, so you, I was waiting for you to say that you keep your previous ones underneath the one that you revise. Like, do you keep those? No. I, I feel should. like it'd be pretty cool to look back at the first one that you did. I feel like that'd be, like, to see how different it would be or to see, you know, how similar it would be. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it would be. I mean, I think of my, the first time I did this, and again, first time I did this was probably 15 years ago. I mean, I, no, I take that back. It was 2003. It would have been 17 years ago. Um, yeah, it would have been different. It would have been, but a lot of it just kind of gets tweaked a little bit. So again, that whole life, my core values of life, that's been pretty constant for a, a good 10 years. So, but yeah, I don't have, that's a great idea. I wish you would have said, I wish I met you 17 years ago, Kevin. Hey, right back at you. I, I would have done that. Something tells me you wouldn't have asked me that 17 years ago. <laughs> I also have a quick question with the assignment for Friday. Are we hopping back on another Zoom call for that? No, no, you're, you're on your own with this one. So no. we just need to make sure we have it done by Friday so that by next Wednesday, we'll have our stuff together, yeah. basically. After the yeah, day. I'm just, I'm, I'm giving you the same drill sergeant, like, training I was given. You're, you have 48 hours. Like, it was a command. It wasn't a suggestion. Like, you have 48 hours to complete this assignment. And I'm like, what? I remember going home. I mean, I, I just remember going home and I'm like rattled from the conference. Yeah, it was long. It was a long day. I was, I was kind of lost for words. And I did it. And it was hard. And I had to think about it. You've changed. We're supposed to. Oh, nice. Thank you. All right. You can unshare that screen. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Whoever shared that, can you unshare it? So I can see everybody? There we go. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, you got 48 hours to do that. You're, it's self-accountability. It's not me holding people accountable. This is all you. I'm not inspecting any of your guys' work. I'm not asking you guys to share any of your values with me unless you want to. I'm not opposed to receiving an email that, hey, Jamie, you know, take a look. And again, you know, I, I put stuff on there. Hey, be extremely healthy in all four areas. And I was full of crap. So, so you're going to have to change some of these things because it can look really pretty on paper. Hey, mom and dad, this is who I am. Is that really who you are? Or is that who you want to be? 
And somehow you got to bridge the gap between who you want to be and who you are to be the same. I heard this once before. A mission statement is who you are. A vision statement is who you want to be. It's kind of a blend of the two. A mission statement is who we are. This is who I am. This is my mission. A vision statement is who you want to be. So this whole values thing is kind of a combo of that. And ultimately, you become the person you vision yourself to be. And you become a great husband or a great wife. You become a great father or a great mother. You become, become a great business person, philanthropist. I mean, I th look, at, look at the model that I've had of Gary Polson. And many of you, obviously, we, we work with, with guys like Gary. Gary is the uh, well-rounded isn't even the right choice of words. I mean, he's just on it. I mean, forget about how much success he's had as a business person. Years ago, his family would be watching, um, it was before I ever had kids, family watched like American Idol or something like that. And uh, his daughter made some comment like, oh, look at that guy that mom likes as far as candidates. You know, he's, he, he's got hair. He's unattractive. Like, she thought bald men were attractive because that's how much she thought of her dad. Like Gary's kids just love dad. Like he's a, he's an unbelievable father for these children. He's an unbelievable husband for his wife. He didn't, he wanted to improve education in LA. So he started his own school. He's big into philanthropy. He gives people money. You know, so I'm kind of like, how does this guy win in every department of his life? He's had clear vision of what's important and what his values are. Like, I mean, you want to talk to a guy who spent lots of time diving deep on the inner self? Gary Polson's that guy. So again, if, you, if that appeals to you, like, yeah, I want a good life. Well, what's a good life to you? I mean, a lot of people, you know, I, I find that th this was a thought that went through my mind in my early 20s as a young businessman. Do I want to be a successful family guy? Or do I want to be a successful business guy? Now, the reason I made that an or was because most people that I knew that were really kick ass dads, they weren't doing that well in business, it seemed, or with their money. They, they had jobs that were fairly, I don't want to say easy, but they didn't demand more than 40 hours a week, so they got to be great dads. The guys that were really good at making money, they seemed to not have very good family lives. I'm like, man, this kind of sucks that I have to make a choice. And then I meet guys like Gary, and I meet guys like Ken, and I met guys like Jim Majeski, and the list goes on and on, and I'm like, Whoa, there are people in this world that have it all. Like, what, what do I want a successful life to look like? I have to be a successful family guy. Have to be. I'm not willing to compromise that. I want to be successful in my career and have options financially. I want to give lots of money to charity. I don't really want to compromise that. I want to be in my community. I want to care about the people I live with. So, I mean, there's all these big rocks that are wildly important. The good news, and again, we'll get to that next week, put first things first, is you can have it all. I feel like one of those like multi-level marketing seminar things saying you can have it all right now. But no, you can have the life you want. You just have to be very intentional and you've got to craft it. It starts with crafting the values and it starts with crafting the mission statement. Tough, again, tough stuff. There's no right or wrong on this. You just gotta do it. All right, what hey, else? Uh, Jamie, I was gonna ask you a question which you, you sort of touched on briefly, but um, what do you do about the values, well, the principles that you don't yet value, but that you want to value? Um, should they just not be included in your, in your mission statement and in your list because you don't actively value them? You, like take health, for example, that was something you wanted to include, but couldn't until you changed your behavior. That would be a good example for me too. Like I'd love to work out. I don't. So 
I want to value my health, but I don't yet. Um, what's the approach for parsing the ones you actively value and the ones you want to value? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, to me, it probably sounds like just a separate list. Hopefully it's a short list, right? So it's like, hey, here's the four things that I want to make values uh, or priorities in my life that aren't there yet based on my actions. Like, again, like you said, there was a good example with the whole health thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just a separate list. Call it a vision statement, if you will, or call it values I want to adopt. But I'll be honest with myself, I haven't adopted them yet. And I can say that based on, you know, I mean, I heard this, this goes along with it as well, too. When a person dies, here's deep thoughts for you. When a person's dead, if you ever want to find out what they truly valued, take a look at their checkbook and take a look at their calendar. What people spend their time and money on will tell you exactly what's important to them. Hey, Jamie. Just pause on that for one second. I want you guys to just pause on that for a second. I've, I've thought of that a lot. I thought of that a lot. I remember one time I had a, I had a Nordstrom's uh, withdrawal for like a thousand bucks. And I'm like, you know, if somebody, if I died tomorrow and somebody wanted to find out what was important in Jamie's life, oh yeah, he can put something in a piece of glass and sure that looks good, but I just saw his checkbook. He donated a hundred dollars to charity, but he spent a thousand dollars on new clothes for himself. He's not that charitable. He was more into his own personal image than he, again, that's a hard thing to swallow. Yeah, nobody's calling me out on this stuff. This is personal integrity that is required. So I like your question because, again, it's just a personal integrity. Like, I'm not just going to slap it under a piece of glass. I'm going to write down what's a, of what's a value to me. And you know what? I've got a separate list going on here. This is who I want to become. This is my vision statement of the man I want to grow up to be. I say this to a lot of people. I mean, I hope when I grow up, I'm like you. I, I say that a lot. I'm 47 years old, and those words come out of my mouth a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm still a, a work in project. I have, have by no means arrived yet. All right, sorry, Teresa, I kind of cut you off there. I think it's Teresa. Yeah, it's okay, I cut you off. I, I thought you were done talking. Um, I, I thought maybe I, I might just add something that would help everybody identify their values um, because um, I used to, I thought that I would like, that I knew what my values were, but we did like this 21 day leadership challenge once um, and they taught you how to identify the values of yourself and in other people um, just based on what pisses you off actually. Hmm. So if you could think of like, um, like an event that made you really, really like upset, like disproportionately upset. Like if, if your boyfriend cheated on you and you got mad, like that's okay. Cause everybody would be mad about that. But got to think of something that maybe wouldn't have pissed off someone else as much as it made you upset. And then you have to figure out what core value it violated. Because um, before I did that challenge, I thought I knew what my values were. And then they came out a lot different than what I thought they were originally once I looked at it that way. That's great. Thank you for sharing. I mean, yeah, if it drives an emotional response, there's a tell, right? If the, if the blood gets boiling or the enthusiasm gets high, there's a tell that there's a, there's a value there for sure. I like that. Anybody else? Anybody deep thoughts? Are we, are we done? I got, I've got, 90 minutes just went by. I got a quick question, Jamie. So, uh, so you brought up a good point um, in, uh, you know, putting it down on a frame and putting it in a frame. You know, that's, that's one thing. Or, get, you know, listening to videos, reading books a million times, that's one thing. There's always, like, a time period between where you have, like, the idea or myself, I may listen to a book a million times. So the action of, like, whatever you're whatever and you like miraculously actually decide to do it and then things change right like uh 
have you found a way or what is what's the tool you can use to minimize the amount of time lapse that there is between the time that you incorporate the vision to the action itself? I want to say, what do you mean? We're having a hard time hearing you, but what do you mean? Like, for example, if you, uh, you, you, wrote, you write down the mission statement of your values and you put it on the screen, right? But there's certain actions you have to start immediately taking. Like, for example, if there's a, if there's a separation between uh, wanting to be physically healthy and actually being physically healthy, right? And you can put that idea down, but at some point you actually have to take a step. Right, you have to start doing something in order to do it. I think for you, maybe it was doing the one on ones with yourself is that kept that discipline. But there's a period of time that lasts between the idea of someone that wants to become a certain way before they actually start taking the action to become that. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, back to habit one in between stimulus and response, there's a space stimulus, response, and that's choice. So it's interesting. It's like, it's like you hear a lot of people say this in our business. Like when I decided I was going to do this, like when I went all in and closed the back doors, I became a business owner pretty fast. It's when you have all these open doors that, you know, so it's interesting that, so time elapses what you're talking about. It's like, well, actually in that stimulus response space in between, choice the power to choose it really is in the blink of an eye i mean i had a choice to make to backspace the word physical from my values because obviously that's not important to me i had a choice to make right then and there and it's not like a bunch of time went by it was a choice and a choice is made in a split second so again the, the that when you think of the value of this course once you get all this stuff straight with like what's important to you, your values, all the decisions going forward, all the little decisions going forward are actually kind of easy. I hate to use the word easy. It's because you already made the choices. It's like a good marriage tip here for you. Before I got married, I really struggled with the thought of, oh, geez, like, like one woman? I mean, there's 3.5 billion women on the planet, and I'm going to choose, like, one woman till death do you part. It's a pretty big commitment. You know, I'm probably like a lot of other guys. Like, oh, I don't know, commitment. I mean, I went through the same thing. Um, and I, I took the plunge, right? When I was 30, I got married. It's funny. I made the decision. But what's interesting is, I don't have to make the decisions anymore going forward because I already made the big decision. I already made the decision to be faithful to my wife no matter what. So whatever weird predicament I get thrown into as life goes on, I've already made the decision. The important decision was made and I'm staying faithful to my wife. 17 years later, hey, I got a, my track record's clean. I'm batting 100% on that decision that I made. So I don't have to make the hard decisions tomorrow because the hard decision was already made. It's interesting. Once I made that decision to get married and accept that until death do you part, I lost all the fear of the whole commitment stuff. It all went away. I was actually quite shocked that I'm like totally cool with walking down the aisle and getting married. I mean, that's the power of this stuff. That's the power of you make a choice between stimulus and response. I don't know if that's a good analogy to give for you guys with marriage, but again, it's a powerful one. So if you make the choice on so many of these values, and again, they're hard choices to make, but this is who I am, this is who I wanna be, then I'll tell you, as time gets thrown, when things get thrown your way, the decisions have already been made. It's almost like as this coronavirus thing crept up on us, I didn't really have any tough decisions to make. The decisions were made 17 years ago. Hope that makes sense for you guys. Coming out of the coronavirus, you'll have decisions to make, but you know what? If you make these hard decisions of who you are and who you want to be, 
and some things that maybe you don't like about yourself that you're going to change. You're going to break those cycles and those decisions. And this is going forward. I mean, this is the HEP values that I hope one day my kids take and they're like, ah, oh, dad had 31, 15 for me. Thank you very much. Or, you know, change a little bit, but I hope this stuff lasts generations beyond myself. So again, it's a heavy, it's a heavy subject here. This whole begin with the end, end in mind, but you are not wasting your time doing this. You guys, this is going to change your lives if done right. So, you know, the homework assignment, I'll somehow shoot a recording of this to you guys one way or another and figure out how to open up the bridge a little bit more next time. But again, we're going to meet again exactly one week from now and it's going to be habit three. Habit three. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in for 90 minutes, you guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jamie.